All right, we are at time, so welcome everyone, and we'll, we'll get started with uh, Scott talking about state of OCI. Take it away, Scott. All right, thank you, Preeti. Uh, it's good to see everyone. I'm seeing a whole bunch of people in the chat. I haven't given a talk in a while, so this is fun. Uh, this is just a short talk, uh, state of open containers, uh, like where are we at, um, and like where where you know where where do I see it going basically in a nutshell. So I have a, just a quick little agenda. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about like where we're at today, um, you know, exciting developments, and then where I how I think this changes the future, and like is this still interesting, um, or is this boring, and are we done? Um, and I've been doing this for a long time now. It, it's 2023 and I've been doing this since like 2014, uh, right after like pre Docker 1.0. So like almost nine years, like nine years, almost 10 years now we're at. That's completely insane to think that containers have been around that long. Uh, and now I'm the product manager for RHEL server, um, but I still obviously keep my fingers in the container stuff. And I'm still the, uh, the trademark board representative for Red Hat. So I basically just vote on budgets once a year. I don't do anything that exciting. But uh, either way, that is kind of the, the the actual what I want you to learn. But then I have my secret uh, agenda. I want to convey why I think OCI is still here to stay. And I think it's still something that has a huge future in front of it. Um, I want to talk about why source containers are important, which I feel like it gets ignored. It's one of those things like it's like paying your taxes or you know putting money to save away for your retirement. Like nobody wants to do it, but like it's important. Um, and then I, a more exciting one, this is like buying stocks in like 2020, like Wasm is really exciting. Like that's like source containers is your bonds. Wasm is your stocks. Um, and this is from evil Scott McCarty, um, the evil principal product manager for real server. And also I used mid journey to like blend this image with like a random dude on the internet that was like a, uh, I don't know, had like a hood on. And so you will see that I created all these images custom, which I think are pretty funny. Uh, okay. So. What is the mission of the Open Containers Initiative, right? It is a lightweight, open governance structure um, under the auspices of the Linux Foundation, blah, blah, blah. So basically, it's been really cool since the OCI was formed because um, essentially all of the communication between registry servers and container engines, and then even the way container engines talk to a container runtime to fire up a container have all been standardized. And this standardization has not led to boredom. In fact, it is it is led to boredom politically but led to really interesting things technically. And I'll go through some of those things that I think are exciting in each of these sort of spheres. So we're going to cover uh, basically three main areas. So like around the image spec, the runtime spec, and the distribution spec. If you're not familiar with these, the image spec is basically what governs on disk, uh, you know, like what is pulled from a registry server. Um, the runtime spec is what governs the piece of JSON that is given to a runtime and then how that runtime talks to Linux kernel to basically fire it up. Uh, fire up a container, I should say, not it. Um, and then the distribution spec, which is the newest one, is actually about the communication between the registry server and the con typically a container engine or a tool like something like Scopio. But it's essentially standardizing the communication channel between the registry and a, some kind of client. Um, so what can we talk about with the, the distribution spec? So I came up with uh, this, this. It's standardized. It's working well. It's boring. And this is a good thing, right? There is a version 1.1 that is pre-released right now, and I'll go into that deeper when I talk about the image spec. But in a nutshell, the distribution spec is working perfectly for the most part. Like there's no, like we don't, you don't have the problem today where you like build an image, stuff it in ACR, try to pull it, uh, you know, out down from a Podman, you know, push it in with Docker, pull it out with Podman, everything works, right? Like there's a very well, there's probably 25 different container registries. There's always new ones popping up. Every cloud provider has their own. Um, there's at a minimum Docker and Podman and Container D and Cryo, which are used daily by you know millions of people. And so you're like, and it's all working fine and you don't hear about too many problems uh, about pushing and pulling images. So this is brilliant, it's working. I tried to generate a cool image that showed boredom. Like a, I was actually trying to generate a dragon sleeping with like a tiny container in its paw. And uh, I was going to say it was boring, but this is the closest I could come up with. It always made the container the same size as the dragon. There was no way to make the dragon huge and the container small. Like I wanted a giant 1980s Dungeons and Dragons dragon, but it wouldn't do it. So, oh, well, mid journey, you succeeded kind of. All right. So I will comment on each image at the end, I think. Uh, 
So the image spec, uh, what is interesting about the image spec? Well, like, like the distribution spec, it's also got the pre-release uh, version 1.1 done. These are pre-committed. You can see them in GitHub. And the cool things about these is that I will say like the things I would say that you care about is the people that worked on this put a ton of like brain power into making these backwards compatible so that any existing container registry can handle all of these things like source containers, signatures, six store cosign, uh, bill of material, you know, software bill of material stuff, Helm chart, singularity, tecton bundles, um, all of these things to some extent or another essentially abuse uh, the image spec or, you know, to basically stuff things in container registries that aren't. And we've been doing this for a long time. Like Helm charts have been doing it. The source container stuff, we've been doing it. Uh, you know, the cosine guys, gals and guys have started to do it, you know, for a long time, for a pretty long time, like a year and a half at least or more. Um, long story short, every, but there was a clear hunger that we needed to be able to do this. And we tried all kinds of different ways. Um, like, for example, source containers, we abuse the tags. I think Cosign was abusing the tags and basically just creating like adjacent tags to the like latest or adjacent tags to the version. And then just as they, there's a sort of a saying, polluting the tag space, if you will. Uh, but now the cool part with the 1.1 is there's an official way to do it. And so for the old container registries that don't support the new, uh, the new verbs essentially for this, um, it'll still work abusing tags. But but in the future, it'll actually be much more efficient. So if you have a red, giant registry at a cloud provider and it needs to scale, they have the option to move to the 1.1 version and it'll actually scale better and have better performance and have less interactions between the registry server and the client, which is cool. So it kind of satisfi satisfies both needs and people can upgrade to 1.1 um, as, as necessary or as need dictates. But as we all know, like infrastructure is really hard to upgrade. So it'll probably take... Nobody wants to say this, but it'll probably take years to get all of the registry servers upgraded to 1.1. It's just kind of the way the way uh, things like this work. But it's still exciting because now we actually have an official way to store all these other things side by side with container images. And I think there's a ton of exciting stuff with this, which I'll go into a little bit more uh, in a later chunk. All right. So what's exciting around the runtime? Uh, definitely exciting. Like even if you look through the, the agenda here. The virtual machine stuff is exciting. There's CATA containers, there's Kubevert, there's libkrun, which I think Sergio is giving a talk later. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that we're plumbing these things together uh, to basically run containers. And some are in a OCI compliant runtime. Some are just mirror, mirror the interface. There's like all these different ways to do this stuff. Um, and the cool part is since these container standards exist, uh, it makes it possible to then innovate around them, right? And all of these things are user space defined. So you get you know this perfect conversation for containers plumbing but like there's all these different ways to implement them down in the kernel and it's cool to see a bunch of different a uh, bunch of different technologies all targeting different like use cases second most exciting thing and this is one where i've spent a lot of my time in the last six months is the wasm stuff so c run um can actually run wasm stuff now um and uh and so can container d and they'll and even though they implement them slightly different it actually ends up being uh, essentially materially the same. So like I've actually chatted with the Docker guys a lot and our strategy is essentially the same. Um, the goal is to basically preserve OCI images as the delivery format. And whether you run the WASM binaries within a container, an OCI container or not, those are kind of a technical implementation choice. And there's there's pros and cons to each way. Uh, but long story short, CRUN runs them in the container. Container D runs them outside of a container. But they both get delivered by the OCI image spec and distribution spec. So it's it's essentially materially, in my opinion, the materially the same from a strategy perspective. Um, and then the other, the last thing I'll bring up is C group V2 adoption. So um, C group V2 became optional in RHEL 8, where we supported run C and C run. Um, as of RHEL 9, I just point out RHEL because RHEL is what I'm most familiar with. And it's also like a bellwether for like, what is truly mature, if you will, because we're pretty conservative. Um, in RHEL 9, it's actually the default, uh, and we support C groups V2 with both run C and C run, but it's actually defaulting to C run in, in RHEL 9. And so you're you're basically seeing that like C groups V2 is definitely becoming the the new the new default, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so exciting developments. Let me go grab. I just realized I do not have a container or not do not, not do not have a command line up let me grab one and bring it over because like in a little bit here i have to do a demo um sorry for the slight pause okay so let's talk about some exciting developments uh 
first things, I think two main technologies that I've been paying a lot of attention to in the last six months to a year have been around six door cosine and Wasm. I think two of these things are like probably around the OCI. I think they're like a testament to how powerful like the OCI standards are um, that we're now finally kind of improving. I, I would say, actually, I shouldn't even say we're, we're improving the security and that's like a byproduct, but like the fact that we're able to do it with the same technology is what's cool. So we're seeing ourselves, as I mentioned before, stuff all kinds of things in container registries, bill of materials, signatures, um, binary, different binaries. And so basically when you look at these two technologies, we're basically kind of, uh, as I mentioned before, we were abusing the OCI spec and now we actually have an official way to do this as of V1.1, which is really exciting. Um, but six store cosine, think of it this way, it's a way to stuff container signatures in a container registry side by side with the images that are signed. Um, and then think of Wasm as a different binary format, not x86, not ARM. It's actually built for a specific virtual machine. Uh, and basically, in a nutshell, it's cross-platform. And it's very fast. It's not like a dynamic virtual machine. It's more of a static virtual machine. Uh, it's almost like assembly language. Um, and so it has the potential to be very close to like a native speed, but yet still be cross-platform. It also has the advantage um, of being very fast startup. So basically you can hand Wasm binaries to the, the virtual machine and it will just run them really fast. And so there's sort of, I'll talk about here in a second, there's different use cases. Okay, so let's talk about six store. What do we do today? Um, I've mentioned this probably a million times over the last five years is like, nobody wants to admit this, but we have a dirty secret. We rely on SSL for security. Like most registry servers have SSL certificates that are registered with one of the certificate authorities. And we basically, just like we use for web security, we trust that, hey, if I go to redhat.com or oci.org, um, you know, if I go to either of these, I trust that that entity has registered the SSL certificate and been checked or whatever. Um, and that's kind of like good enough for us. That That's like what we do today. N there are not that many people actually verifying the signatures. Now, Red Hat, for example, for years now, for as long as I can remember, has produced GPG signatures for our container images. But again, I will just, the dirty secret is I don't think that many people verify them. I'll be honest with you. It's there. It's a blocker for some people, for some very security conscious people, and they want to do it. But most of the time, they just don't care. So most people just don't verify at all. That's bad. Um, and it falls back to just relying on SSL. And so it's not explicitly verifying where you're getting these images from. Um, and that leaves us with some problems. Like you can't have the same image in two different places and just trust the SSL certificates from two different organizations. So for example, UBI is out, uh, the UBI Red Hat Universal Base images are out on Docker Hub and they're at uh, registry.access.redhat.com. So they're on two different registries. They're the same images, but there's no like universal way to verify them on both on both registry servers. So that's, that's bad. Um, or it just makes things hairy, I guess I should say. Um, now, what does six store do? Six store is really cool because it it's it's an end to end security between the artifact and the container engine, right? So so if Docker or Podman wants to pull down uh, an image from either registry, whether it's Red Hat's registry or Docker Hub, that's cool. Now I can actually verify that these images are identical, and I can let users do whatever they want, and as long as it passes the tests, we're good to go. Basically, passes the the, the verification test, and it also happens very automatically. So like uh, it is very easy to generate signatures. Uh, push them into the registry, pull them down, verify them. Like it's it's super easy to use essentially from both a, a generate and verify perspective. Whereas GPG signatures, they, they're we, like, for example, today, if you want to use simple signatures, you know, simple GPG signatures, you can definitely do it. You can generate them. They're not that hard, but you have to set up your own, your own server, HTTP server, where you're going to serve them from and then verify them. Whereas like since, since uh, Cosign just automatically pushes them into the registry side by side, it's really easy to use. Um, the next thing that's awesome with six store is it sets you up for doing S bomb again, Red Hat has, has historically had, I, I, I hate to use this word, but a proprietary because nobody else really adopted it. Not that we made it closed source or anything, but it was just Red Hat only. We have our way that we do a RATA, but in the future, obviously we we'll, we're looking at other S bomb, like, like where does S bomb take the software world? And can we all now share like a single way of doing, uh, you know, a RATA essentially and, and knowing what's inside of. Uh, what software is inside of a container image or on a server, or on a virtual machine, et cetera, et cetera. SBOM looks like there's some f standards forming that will, will be real, and it's definitely got a lot of heat behind it this time. And it seems like we're set up now to do this really well in the container world. So I think that's pretty exciting. Okay, so 
moving on to uh, Wasm, which actually is probably the one that I've even spent more time. Um, there's sort of two different use cases. The one that I'm excited about, I will fully admit, is more the traditional one. But I will say there's like I was at KubeCon in Detroit, and there is a bunch of startups and whatnot that are very excited about the cloud native use case. So let's talk about these two use cases. So this is a binary format, as I mentioned uh, when I introduced it. This is a it runs on its own virtual machine essentially. Think of it as Java, but more static than Java. No, J, no, no dynamic memory stuff. That that kind of stuff. Although there is the option to have that. Um, they essentially think of it as it, it started from the browser, moved to the back end, similar to how JavaScript did. Um, and now it's looking to be honestly like it might be potentially a really powerful standard that we could use all over the place, anywhere where you need cross platform or really fast startups. So the traditional use cases that I'm excited about are cross platform binaries, because I think even in my own experience doing some side projects, working with like a person on an M1 Mac or an M2 Mac versus my x86 Linux laptop, it's a pain because I can't just push the, I can create a container, uh, even if it's, and we were doing Ruby on Rails for the side project. So this was not anything that was like, uh, one would not think that this is not like we're doing C programming or Rust programming, right? You would think these binaries would just be scripts that then get interpreted by the Ruby interpreter, but that's just not the case. What happens is when you pull in these giant frameworks, they always end up pulling in some kind of C level dependencies, whether it's for encryption or some kind of weird uh, parsing library for something or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But there's there's so many packages when you pull down something as big as like Ruby on Rails that there's always some natively compiled binaries getting compiled in one of the gems. Um, and the same is true with Python and JavaScript and everything else. Basically, every scripting language in the world ends up pulling in some kind of level of dependencies once the project gets big enough. And pretty much everything nowadays when you look at slick web graphics, blah, 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 like almost everything's that big at this point. So like to claim that we don't need cross-platform capabilities is probably lying to ourselves. Uh, so long story short, I would build it on my laptop, upload it to a registry, try to push the image, right? And now my, 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 my colleague cannot pull it down on an M2 Mac. It just doesn't work because the binaries are not right. Like the binaries won't run on the, they were built on, on an x86 and there is some level stuff that is binaries um, and it just always ends up screwing up. So to me, it's exciting because if we could all compile down to like Wasm format, now we really could have a single container image out there, not have to have a build farm that builds one for power, one for ARM, one for x86, one for ARM, M2, blah, 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 not one for uh, Risk Five. eventually in the future, maybe. Uh, excuse me. We could have the potential to have a single format that if it's close to native speed, we could use everywhere. I also think it's exciting because Wasm does have its own security um, context, essentially. So some would argue... With this security context, you don't need containers anymore. Others would argue that still things like SE Linux and C groups and things are very nice to control in the operating system. The nice part is, is you can do it both ways. There's nothing really, there's nothing that stops you from doing it either way. Like I mentioned before, container D does it without a container wrapped around it. Uh, C run does it with a container wrapped around it, but you can do it either way. And honestly, this is a two-way door. Both pieces, both projects can can or could implement it in both ways using some config flag. There's nothing uh, native to the architecture that makes it have to work that way. So like depending on where the market goes or what people want, it's possible to do it both ways. Um, and the other nice thing is this could use this can and will probably use existing infrastructure, registry infrastructure. I think that's super exciting. Um, and that's why I think OCI has a future for like as long as, you know, basically as long as hopefully until I retire. Uh, then on the other side, though, and I'll admit these are not as exciting to me, but they are very exciting to other people, like very fast startup time. So when you look at like the cloud control plane use case, as I call it, like it is it is more about starts and stops than it is about runtime performance. So like as long as you can start and stop a VM really fast or start and stop a container really fast or start and stop a process really fast, that's what's more important at scale when you have uh, you know thousands of things that are starting and stopping per minute or per, per second kind of thing. Um, that's more of a serverless style use case. That's more of a cloud style use case. It's not the normal daemon use case. Uh, that's especially important when you're writing functions as a service or serverless style things. Um, and there's a lot of startups that are trying to build. Uh, Fermion is trying to build an entire business around that. Uh, and so it's interesting to see that that's happening too. And both of these use cases, I think, are being satisfied by Wasm. So it's pretty interesting. It's a diverse community. All right. So let's jump into a quick demo. Uh, let me see if I, I think I have to reshare my desktop. Let me share my window entire, we'll just share my entire screen. I think I can do that, yeah. All right, let's see if you will get to see that. Can you all see that? Can anyone, 
verify that you can see that. I believe you can. Let me double check. Yes, it looks like you can. Nobody is responding, but I believe you can. Yes, you can All see. Right. <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, I am in here. Oh, let me get out of here. Let me get in my other demo. Uh, Wasm demo. So I have two small ones. Uh, very easy. Nothing magical here, but I just want to at least show uh, how these work. So this one. Oops, let me go back to my. So I want to kind of show you. This is essentially the command I used to build um, a WASM binary into a, a into a container image. Basically, you can see it's called WASM demo app. And basically, all I did was do this annotation. And then when Podman runs it, it's going to be smart enough to say, hey, this is a WASM app, not a x86 binary running on my local laptop. Hey, go execute this with WASM Edge or WASM Time or WASM or depending. And there's actually a an order that uh, basically... Podman is really smart, or C Run is very smart. It knows whether basically which one's installed, and then it just has a search order. It's statically, statically compiled into C Run, but if you have C Run compiled the right way, this just works. Um, so you can see here, if I, I won't rebuild it, it, although it takes two seconds, I will show you Podman images. I will show you here's the Wasm demo app, and then I will show you what happens when I run this bad boy. Um, it is very easy, it just does a hello world. Um, you can actually also run this locally. Uh, um, Scott, can you can you make it a little slightly bigger? Yeah, how's that? Better? Yes, perfect. All right, thank you. So you can also I kind of showed uh, here. Where is it in my history? You can actually run this with either one of these runtimes. I have both of them installed. So you can see this would be running it without a container. Um, it just does a hello world, and obviously I can do the same thing with Wasm time. Uh, uh, but but. But the beauty is I can then run it in a container as well, just this easily. And now the difference between the way these were executed is these were secured only with this Wasm binary was allowed to run through the Wasm Edge runtime or the Wasm time. So there's sort of a layer of security. But when you run it with Podman, it's actually running this Wasm time in the container. And Pod and C run with Podman is smart enough to know, uh, you know, basically to execute it in a container. So I think this is a pretty cool. The fact that we have this flexibility and this ability to do this. Um, you can see it's a very simple app, but essentially you compile the binary, then stuff it in a container registry, then run or in a container image. You can push that out to container registry, pull it down, and then run it. So like it has all the beauty of a container. Um, the other small demo I wanted to show you was around source containers. So I have not. Uh, so, so a lot of people are not aware that like all UBI Red Hat Universal Base Image container images. Again, we we abuse the or we pollute the. Uh, image or the tag space, if you will. But you'll see this is a very specific version and build of UBI. And then I can just say, hey, dash source, add this dash source to the end. And when I run this command, Scopio will just copy. It'll literally go find all the objects in the registry and pull each of them down and put them in that source directory. So now you'll see in this source directory after this thing gets done, this goes pretty fast. Um, the beauty of this now is, is that people don't realize like, Red Hat goes above and beyond a lot of the time. Like we we share, for example, all the source code for everything in RHEL, even if it's Apache or BSD or MIT licensed. Like we we share the source code because because the easiest way, you know, some open source licenses require nothing. Other ones require attribution, and other ones are copyleft and require actual full release of source code. Um, we just go above and beyond and and release the source code for everything because the easiest way to satisfy the attribution requirements is just to release the source code. And the easiest way to satisfy no requirements is to release the source code. Um, and so this is sort of another manifestation of that is that we, if you look at copyleft, it says essentially that all the source code should be available in like and kind. So if it's available on an FTP server as files, uh, or I'm sorry, if you download the binaries from an FTP server, you should be able to download the source code from an FTP server. If you download, if you get it from a CD-ROM, you should be able to have the source on the CD-ROM. If you're stuffing a container image with a bunch of binaries of open source that's copyleft in Docker Hub or Quay.io or wherever, theoretically, you should have the source code side by side with it. Um, this is like one of those things where I think the whole world's probably doing it wrong, but like we've been doing it wrong for a long time. And so we just kind of we just kind of like do it wrong. But Red Hat is trying to do it right by having essentially these source containers. All right. So let me go back to... I think we are back to that. All right, so I've done a demo. 
and it actually succeeded and didn't fail. And so the demo monster is happy. This is the demo monster. I created, I, I forgot, I said, create a monster made out of source code. And this is what I got. So it's kind of funny. Uh, that's mid journey. Um, all right. So the future, I have like five minutes. I think the, the future is exciting because we will have containers on Mars. Um, these are OCI containers on Mars. I thought that was kind of funny too. Uh, but improved service like, you know, serverless like services for developers. Obviously, there's like a whole ecosystem of people trying to tackle that. Um, even Red Hat within OpenShift is trying to tackle this um, uh, within our service as a function stuff. Um, but I think that is an exciting place where there's still a lot to be done. Um, I think in crew, improved cross-platform interactions are probably the place where I'm the most excited. Like when you look at the in-vehicle OS stuff that Red Hat's doing, for example, one of the biggest pain points I see is trying to compile something once and run it everywhere, um, run it in test and run it in production, or run it in dev, run it in production. This is like the basic promise of containers. But when the architectures of dev are different than the architectures of production, which happen to be in a vehicle, that makes it really hard. So the, the options are, Everybody runs a virtual machine and then you know runs a virtual machine and simulates the architecture or they cross compile. There's like no good way to do this. Like we've explored every possible way there is to do this. Um, it's not easy. Having a single format would be really cool. So I, to me, I'm not saying this will happen, but it's one of the places where I think it could alleviate problems. As I mentioned, something as simple as me being on an x86 laptop and my colleague being on an M2 Mac is hard enough to deal with. Uh, and that's just for like a Ruby on Rails project, nothing amazing. Um, and then I think the third one is the improved security. Like I think you can get the best of both worlds and it's security, it's defense in depth, basic principles, where if you run WASM in a container, it is definitely going to be more secure. One could argue there might be performance penalties, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. Those are always trade-offs. But in a nutshell, I think the security is still is at least exciting for certain use cases um, because you know the, there's there are always people that need more security. All right. Uh, so there are some Q&A. Do you want to... Yes, I have one more minute. I will. I want to plug everyone else's talks. Uh, when Podman eats, uh, desktop eats, uh, CLI dwellers eat too uh, today at at five, you know, seventeen thirty UTC. Uh, there's a Wasman Wazi talk by Aditya, and we I chatted with him a little bit before I did this demo. Uh, I think you should check that out tomorrow. I think it's really cool. Colin, we're talking about Bootsy, which I think is a nice tie-in to the talk that was given earlier today. Um, and then Murnal will be giving a talk tomorrow about, and Peter and a whole bunch of colleagues I know uh, about the future of CRI. And I think that is also a good talk. Um, and then I just want to show you my community image that I generated mid journey, which I thought was hilarious. But come join the OCI community. Like it's super open. Everybody's cool. There's open meetings, there's mailing lists, there's chats, there's a technical oversight board. Uh, there's other special working groups, like, for example, the one that worked on the, the uh, artifacts for, for stuffing other things inside of container registries. And with that, I have two minutes to do questions. All right. Um, I, I see three in Q&A. The first one, should we repackage our images with Wasm for faster startup? I think that's a tough question to answer. I think it really, I ha so again, in the traditional use case, I have never seen startup time be the bottleneck. Like I've never had someone be like, oh, it starts so slow. Um, but I will say in the cloud native use case, if you are scaling this out and you're doing it as like serverless and you're Amazon and you have 42,000 things starting and stopping per second, that's when that matters, right? And so like there are definitely use cases where that matters. But I would say for the vast majority of the world that I am exposed to, um, it, it, it does not matter that much. Like, so I would say, I would say leave it in an OCI container, start it, get the extra security, you know, whatever. That's my All right. opinion. Um, what Oh, is six store CA a single point of security failure? Is which thing? Is six store CA a single point of security failure? That's the next question. That is a good question. I have not thought through that. Um, I guess it's worked for it's worked for the internet for long enough. And and CAs can definitely be made highly available so that they're not a single point of failure and there's definitely domain level ways of, you know, domain security level ways of balancing things and routing things. I would say no. I, I would say there's well, there are well uh, understood ways to make all those things highly available and it works for the internet. So I don't think so. Okay. Then the next but question. That was a good question. I had to think very hard quickly there. What, <laughs> what resource do you recommend for a deep dive into containers? Preferably a book. Oh. Right? 
I have to. <laughs> I would have to recommend Dan Walsh's new book. I, Podman I just, in action. Yeah, Podman in action. I have to definitely recommend that. He, he, his. I don't know how his brain works this well. Like I forget so much stuff, and then I read his book, and I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Like I lived half of this stuff with him, and I cannot remember. I don't know how he remembers all the things he does, but his stuff is awesome. I do still have my Linux container internals. If you just Google that, it's not a book, but it's just uh, some presentation and like labs and things that we still have. But uh, but Dan's book is definitely like the the Bible on this. I think now, in my in my humble opinion. Um, we are at time. But I do see some comments and all of that in the chat. Hopefully, we can get to it later on. Um, uh, Scott, do you have a link to your uh, your slides? Yeah, you can post in the in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Here, let me throw Thank it in you. there real quick. Uh, how do I go back to the chat? Oh, there it is. All right. Here we go. There's a link. I'll I'll put it on CrunchTools.com to my website where I'll where I always like put everything up. I'll put it up afterwards. So it'll be searchable on the internet. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for uh, attending the session. And Scott, thank you for making this very interesting and engaging. Thank you. As always. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.